Hello, and welcome to Chapter 28, Psychiatric Emergencies of the Emergency Care in the Streets Lecture. Upon completion of this chapter and the related course assignments, you should be able to recognize behaviors that are associated with risks to providers, the patient, and others. You should be able to discuss the concerns of treatment and transport of a patient having a psychiatric emergency. You should also be able to identify situations when restraints may be justified and whether chemical or physical restraint is the preferred method. You should also be able to discuss the potential causes of behavioral emergencies and medications that may be used in the treatment of these disorders. And finally, you should be able to describe the assessment process and safe management of a patient having a psychiatric emergency. So let's get started. The mind and body are inseparable parts of the human being. Illness affects the person's behavior, and it also often makes them anxious or depressed. Changes in mental state influence physical health. A depressed person may lose appetite or become more susceptible to bodily disease. Whenever you examine a patient, try to understand both the physical and mental factors contributing to the patient's disease. Most experts define behavior as the way people act or perform. Behavior is all things people do, the reason they do these things. Overt behavior is open and generally understood by those around the person. Covert behaviors are those that have hidden meanings or intentions that only the person understands. Almost all disordered behavior represents the person's effort to adapt to stress. In most cases, the disruptive behavior abates while the person mobilizes his or her physiologic defense mechanism. Okay, so while we're continuing through the definition of a behavioral emergency, let's define behavioral emergencies, situations in which the patient's presenting problem is some disorder of mood, thought, or behavior that interferes with activities of daily living. ADL stands for activities of daily living, and that equals normal everyday activities. A psychiatric emergency is an abnormal behavior that threatens a person's health or safety or the health and safety of another person. Most extreme examples are when the person becomes suicidal or homicidal or psychotic. In a psychotic episode, a patient often experiences delusions or hallucinations and illusions, and that's errors in perception. So a psychotic episode can have dangerous consequences because of the violent behavior. The imperative definition of a behavioral or psychiatric emergency is provided by the person who dials 911. It can be difficult to perform when you are trying to understand the patient's confused and frayed feelings. Pre-hospital intervention is possible and often critical in these emergencies. According to the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, the average number of mentally unhealthy days for Americans has increased. Americans reported an average of 2.9 mentally unhealthy days per month in 1993, and in 2008, 3.4 days of mentally unhealthy. According to a 2014 study published by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, an estimated 43.5 million adults age 18 years or older were estimated to have had mental illness in the past year. Almost 10 million adults age 18 or older are estimated to have had a serious mental illness within the past year, and 39.8 million American age 18 years or older are to considered current illicit drug users, a compounding factor in many mental illnesses. Serious mental illness is a diagnosis of a psychiatric disorder, for example, with serious functional impairment. When a person's behavior, speech, and thoughts are erratic, it can be difficult for you to communicate clearly. Be prepared to spend time with the patient. Obtain cons consent when possible. If the patient refuses, continue to talk with him or her about the situation and explain your responsibilities. If a patient refuses transport, follow your local protocols and standing orders. You will often need assistance from law enforcement personnel.
Be clear in your explanations when administering treatments and medications, and don't assume that the patient is unable to understand what you're trying to do. Take time and thoroughly record the call. Be objective and factual and include comments made by the patient. Okay, so when it comes to psychiatric emergencies, there are four broad categories, and we're going to talk about those next. So abnormal behavior typically results from a complex interaction of biologic or organic causes, developmental factors, psychologic stressors, emotional stimuli, or social cultural influences. These causes can be classified into four broad categories. Causes that are biologic or organic in nature, causes resulting from the person's environment, causes resulting from an acute injury or illness, or causes that are substance related. Biologic or organic causes is what we're going to talk about first. Many patients who present with psychiatric symptoms are affected by biologic or organic factors that interfere with normal cerebral function. Patients were previously described as having organic brain syndrome. So patients with that thought to be non-organic abnormalities do have psychiatric dysfunction in the brain causing their psychiatric illness. Examples of biologic or organic causes of abnormal behavior include chronic hypoxia, seizure, traumatic brain injury, chronic alcohol or drug abuse, or brain tumors. These conditions alter the normal function of the brain, and they may cause derangements in behavior, and most common offenders are alcohol and drugs, dementia, and delirium. And then there's environmental causes. They may include both psychosocial and social cultural influences. When people are constantly exposed to stressful psychosocial events or developmental influences, they may develop abnormal reactions. When a person's basic needs are threatened, that person faces a crisis and may cope with it or attempt to alleviate the discomfort by escaping from that stress with alcohol, drugs, or suicide. Social psychological factors directly affect biology, behavior, and response to the stress of emergencies, such as assault, rape, violence, or the death of a loved one may produce significant changes in behavior. Next is injury and illness as causes. Acute illness can overwhelm a person causing changes in behavior. Some medical conditions that can cause abnormal behaviors are severe infections, electrolyte abnormalities, or many types of metabolic disorders. An acutely traumatic situation creates stress for the person and those around them. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a severe form of anxiety stemming from a traumatic exposure. Also, substance-related causes um, and the disorders include most often alcohol, cigarettes, illicit drugs, or other substances that change the way the person feels, behaves, or thinks. So when a person's mental health is challenged, psychological mechanisms or behaviors mobilize to return the mental state to homeostasis. It presents with various types of psychiatric signs, symptoms, and behaviors. It can be grouped according to the systems affected, and the psychological functions include consciousness, motor activity, speech, thought. It affects the outward expression or, or of inner feelings, their memories, orientation, and perception. Psychiatric signs and symptoms include these areas as well as changes in the thought progression, thought content, mood, or intelligence. So differences from other typical methods of patient assessment. So when you're assessing a disturbed patient, you are the diagnostic instrument. You must use your thinking processes, your perceptions and feelings. The assessment of a patient with a behavioral emergency is part of the treatment. As soon as you speak to the patient, your voice and manner will affect his or her condition. Listening to the patient describe the issue can also mitigate the problem. So assess the patient wherever the emergency occurs. So let's talk about the patient assessment. When it comes to the scene size up, situations that have a strong behavioral component are most likely the type of call to present surprises. 
These may appear to be simple calls, but the superficial problem may be the result of the patient's own erratic behavior, so you have to ensure your safety at the scene. This table shows safety guidelines for em behavioral emergencies. The environment can give clues to the patient's condition or the cause of the emergency, so look for the potential clues from the patient's social history, general living conditions, availability of social and family support, activity level, medications, and overall appearance. Consider the mechanisms of injury and the nature of illness. When it comes to your primary survey, clearly identify yourself and tell the patient who you are and what you're trying to do. Your general impression, how much of the assessment you're able to perform will be determined by the patient's overall condition, the nature of his or her psychiatric problem. You should at least be able to assess your patient's general appearance. The airway and breathing. So, Tend to the priority problems first, airway, breathing, and circulatory concerns, and assess the airway to make sure it's patent and adequate. Evaluate the patient's breathing and provide interventions based on your findings. When it comes to circulation, assess the pulse rate, quality, and, pro and rhythm. Obtain the systolic and diastolic blood pressures when possible and evaluate for the presence of shock and bleeding and assess the patient's perfusion level by evaluating the skin color, temp, condition, and cap refill. So transport decisions, what we're going to talk about next, and seriously disturbed patients should be seen by a physician. A conscious adult must consent to be taken to a medical facility, so if the patient withholds consent, he or she may be taken against his or her will only at express request of the police or the community medical health physician in some jurisdictions. The same policy applies to the use of forcible restraint, so law enforcement officers should be summoned and every ambulance service should have clearly defined protocols. And then there's history taking, part of your assessment, so mental status examination, or MSE, is a part of the assessment for a patient experiencing an acute psychiatric emergency. Check each of the systems of mental function in order using COAST map. So let's talk about COAST map. The C stands for consciousness, O orientation, A activity, S speech. Then we're going to talk about the map part. So, or T is thought, M is M memory, A is effect, and P is perception. So let's go through this. So consciousness, determine the level of consciousness, whether they're alert, confused, response to pain or responsive. The orientation is ask what year or month it is. Activity is restlessness or agitated, pacing up and down or experiencing tremors or um, making any strange movement or repetitive movements. S is speech, so note the rate, volume, flow, articulation, too fast or too slow or too loud or too soft. Are they using strange words? And then thought. What is on his or her mind? Is the patient making sense? Is there anything unusual about his or her reasoning? And then memory, recent, remote, or immediate. Memories in place of what the patient can or cannot recall. An effect in mood. Is the patient euphoric or sad? Or is the patient um, able to talk? Um, does the effect seem appropriate to the situation? And then the perception. Ask the patient, do you ever hear things that other people cannot hear? Then the secondary assessment, so obtain vital signs. Look for fever or indications of increased intracranial pressure. Examine skin temperature and moisture. Inspect the head for evidence of trauma and check the pupils for size, equality, and reaction to light. Note any unusual disturbances on the patient's breath, such as poisonings or alcohol, or perhaps ketones from diabetic ketoacidosis. In examining the extremities, look for needle marks, tremors, or unilateral weakness or loss of sensations. And then your reassessment. So, routinely performed during transport, 
monitor patients for sudden changes in thought or behavior, and your radio report to the medical facility should include a report of the medical and mental history, medications prescribed, and assessment findings, also any pertinent information from the medical status examination. Discuss with the medical facility the need for restraints or medications before instituting these interventions. All right, so medical care. If the erratic behavior might be caused by a medical disorder, treat that disorder before assuming the behavior is due to an emotional or psychiatric cause. Some measures could include oxygen therapy, testing blood glucose, administrating dextrose, or general interventions for hypothermia or shock management. Communication techniques. So virtually all of the diagnostic information comes from talking with the patient. Set ground rules for your interview and let the patient know what you expect and what he or she may expect of you. Allow the patient to tell their story in his or her own way. Some guidelines include begin with open-ending questions, let the patients talk, and listen and show you're listening. Don't be afraid of silences. Maintain an attentive and relaxed attitude until the patient resumes the story. It is important to be silent when the patient stops speaking because of overwhelming emotion. Acknowledge and label the patient's feelings. Do not argue. Facilitate communication and direct the patient's attention. Ask questions. Keep questions as open-ended as possible and avoid avoid yes or no or leading questions and adjust your approach as needed. So next we're going to talk about some crisis intervention skills. Be as calm and direct as possible and indicate that you are confident that the patient can maintain control. Exclude disruptive people and sit down. Preferably interview the patient while sitting at a 45 degree angle to the patient. Maintain a non-judgmental attitude and provide honest reassurance and develop a plan of action. This step gives the patient the feeling something is being done to help. Don't present an array of choices, but state what you think is best course of action. And once the plan is determined and you have begun to carry it out, allow the patient to make choices and exercise some control over the situation. Encourage some motor activity and stay with the patient at all times. Bring all of the patient's medication to the facility. It will help physicians identify the condition for which the patient has is being treated. And never assume that it is impossible to talk with any patient until you have tried to do so. Okay, so physical restraint. Use of force and types of restraint. So the first one we're gonna talk about is physical restraint. Devices can be improvised from your ambulance materials or commercially made. Commercial restraints may be applied to wrists and ankles or around the waist or from the front of the patient and may include sleeves to restrain arms. Be familiar with the restraints used by your agencies and make sure you have sufficient personnel before restraining the patient. You must have a minimum of at least five trained, able-bodied personnel. And this includes one for each arm and one for the head. Appoint one leader to direct the team. Before you begin, discuss the plan of action. Law enforcement should be included when physically restraining violent patients. Law enforcement might refuse to help restrain a patient in the absence of a warrant for subject's arrest or evidence of, uh, evidence of an immediate threat. Use minimum force necessary and don't immediately move towards the patient. Give him or her a chance to choose nonviolent behavior. If the show of force does not calm the patient, responders must move quickly to restrain. The best position for securing a patient is supine. Never place your patient face down. Throughout the process, you and your partner should talk to the patient. Treat the patient with dignity and respect at all times. Never tie the patient's ankles and wrists together as one. Hobby tie, and that's tied just the feet together. And never place a patient face down. Once restraints are in place, do not remove them and 
don't negate or make de uh, deals. Continuously monitor the patient's airway, breathing, vomiting, airway obstruction, and cardiovascular stability, and check peripheral circulation every few minutes. You want to check radial pulses in the arms and dorsal pedis pulses in the feet. Be careful. If a combative patient suddenly becomes calm and unrecorp and cooperative, remain vigilant. Document everything in the patient's chart, the reasons you use the restraints, examples of the patient's behavior, indications of the violence, the violent potential, number of patients used to subdue the patient, the restraining devices used, and the status of the patient's airway, breathing, and peripheral circulations after restraints were applied. You may be use reasonable force to defend yourself against an attack, having witnesses in attendance can protect you against false accusations. To properly restrain a patient using a four-point physical restraint technique, refer to your skill drill 28-1. A two-point restraint technique is an option if allowed per protocols. So this is performed in the same way as four-point, except instead of restraining all four extremities to the stationary frame of the stretcher, one arm is placed upward towards the head and the other is placed downward towards the waist. Next, we're going to talk about chemical restraint, and it's one alternative to physical restraint. It uses medication to subdue a patient, and this option should be used only with approval of the medical director and by following clearly established local protocols and guidelines. Not always easier than physical restraint, and it has its own hazards, so avoid combinations of sedative medicines, use physical or chemical restraint only after verbal attempts to de-escalate a patient with excited delirium have failed. Make the patient comfortable with a blanket or pillow to reduce an anxiety and often accompanies psychosis. The medications used most often for chemical restraints include short-acting benzodiazepines, antipsychotics, disassociative agents, and antihistamines. Many of these medications have not been approved by the FDA for chemical restraint, though, and the FDA has issued black box warnings for some of those medications. First, we're going to talk about benzodiazepines. Valium, Ativan, or Versed, so diazepam, lorazepam or midazolam is given as either an intramuscular or an IV injection. Only midazolam and lorazepam have reliable IM absorption. Adverse effects are usually mild, easily treated and include drowsiness, decreased mental alertness, sedation, respiratory depression, insomnia, and agitation. Usually a safer and effective form of chemical restraint compared to other medicines. Benzodiazepines are shorter acting, such as midazolam, and may be given internasally. And the onset of the action varies depending on the route of administration. Antipsychotic medications, such as haloperidol or geodon, there is a black box warning for doperperidol because of its association with prolonged QT syndromes, higher dose, and IV administration of haloperidol appears to be associated with the higher risk of the QT prolongation and torsades to points. Haloperidol is commonly administered using IV administration. FDA has not approved this route of administration. Do not administer to patients younger than 14 with those those of a suspected head injury, or those who may be pregnant. Approved for treatment of patients with dementia-related psychosis. Typical antipsychotics may cause seizures or a wide range of symptoms, including involuntary movements, tremors, rigidity, muscle contractions, restlessness, changes in breathing and pulse rate. Combined with alcohol and other CNS depressants, it may worsen the CNS depression. Monitor for hypotension, bradycardia, and glucose levels. Next, we're going to talk about the antihistamines, and specifically Benadryl or diphenhydramine, have been used for many years in the treatment of psychiatric patients. They're best known for the sedative properties.
produces an anticholinergic effect that has some effect on the neurotransmitters in the brains that affect behavior. It can be used for both adult and pediatric patients. Pathophysiology assessment and management of specific emergencies. Okay, so many factors contribute to disturbances of behaviors. The causes, signs, symptoms, and management can be grouped into several common areas. So let's talk about the pathophysiology of acute psychosis. State of delusion in which a person is out of touch with reality. Affected people are turned into their own internal reality of ideas and feelings. And reality and fantasy are blurred. Psychosis and psychiatric episodes occur for many reasons such as biologic or organic mental illness or drug abuse. Causes relating to the patient's environment or mental illness include intense stress, delusional disorders, and schizophrenia. schizophrenia. Psychotic episodes can be brief or last a lifetime, and disorganization and disorientation are ways in which various conditions may present themselves. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, assessment of the acute psychosis. And the most characteristic feature is a profound thought disorder. A thorough examination is rarely possible, and your principal objective is to transport the patient to the medical facility without trauma. Coast map outlines common signs and symptoms. So consciousness. They're awake and alert, but may be easily distracted. Orientation. There's disturbances in orientation are more common in organic disorders than in psychosis. Activity, most commonly accelerated with agitation and hyperactivity. Bizarre stereotype movements are common. And speech, they may be pressured or sound strange because of unusual words the patient has invented. Their thought, they're disturbed in progression and content and may show any of the following disorders. So flight of ideas, loosening of associations, delusions, thought broadcasting, and that's when the belief that thoughts can be heard by others or thought insertion, and that's when the belief that thoughts are being thrust into the mind by another person. Also thought withdrawal, and that's the belief that thoughts are being removed. Memory, and that can be relatively or entirely intact. Affect a mood, so the mood is likely to be disturbed. An effect may result, reflect those of inner states or be flat. Also the perception, so auditory hallucinations are common with acute psychosis. Management, so usual methods of reasoning may not work because the patient may have their own rules of logic. You are likely to feel uncomfortable in the presence of a psychotic person. So the disorganization patient needs structure. Explain in plain language what is being done and what the patient's role will be. Directions should be simple, consistent, and firm. And keep oriented, keep orienting the patient to the time, place, and the people in the environment and who they are and what they're doing. You may have to repeat the information several times and reassure the patient and point out landmarks to help orient him or her. When the patient's behavior threatens his or her own well-being or the safety of others, you must take an aggressive step to prevent the injury. These steps might include physical restraint, chemical restraint, or both. So people experiencing a psychotic episode often do not comply with treatment. So employ non-pharmacologic interventions first. When these methods fail, it may be appropriate to safely restrain the patient and then administer a medication to help the behavior. Follow medical control direction and standing orders when administering medications. Okay, so let's talk about excited delirium next or agitated delirium. You'll see it, see it worded. And so the pathophysiology is a state of global cognitive impairment. It's acute and onset and associated with fluctu fluctuations in mental status and behavior and a disorganized thinking an altered level of consciousness, and usually caused by toxic or metabolic problems or infections. Dementia is the more chronic process that produces severe deficits in memory, abstract thinking, and non-judgment, 
Patients may be agitated and violent when stressors overwhelm them and they are unable to maintain homeostasis. Common risk factors that may preclude delirium include medical histories of hypertension, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, alcohol abuse, or smoking. So assessment of the excited delirium should first try to reorient the patients to the surroundings and circumstances, perform a thorough assessment and management. So identify the stressor or metabolic problem, and uh, it can help determine the treatments. Okay, so next we're going to talk about suicidal ideation. So suicide is any willingful act designed to end one's life. It's the second leading cause of death in 10 to 34-year-olds and the fourth leading cause of death in 35 to 54-year-olds. More common among men and risk also high among alcoholics and depressed patients. It's estimated that at least 1 million people in the United States intentionally harm themselves each year. Attempts typically occur when a person feels that close emotional attachments are endangered, has lost someone or something important in life, or has feelings characteristics of depression. So an assessment, the assessment of a depressed person must include an evaluation of the suicidal risk and many paramedics are reluctant to ask about suicidal thoughts because they fear putting the idea in the patient's head. Approach the subject using a step-wise approach. So have you ever thought that life wasn't worth living or did you ever feel that you would be better off dead? The following patients uh, indicate higher risk who must be evaluated at a medical facility. So patients who have made the previous attempts, patients who have detailed concrete plans, or patients who have a history of suicide among close relatives. When a person phones to threaten suicide, someone should stay on the line until the rescue squad has reached the patient. Um, on arrival, survey the area for any instruments the patient might use for self-injury and remove them, and be sure to protect your own safety. Encourage the patient to discuss feelings and ask about the patient's suicidal in, uh, ideas and plans. Whenever you find a patient that is severely depressed or subject suspect a risk of suicide, do not leave the patient alone. So collect implements of potential self-destruction and bring them with you to the medical facility and acknowledge the patient's feelings. Encourage transport. If the patient refuses, try to get the people who are close to the patient to help with cooperation. It may be necessary to obtain law enforcement assistance. When a person has attempted suicide, medical treatment is priority. If the patient is conscious, Try to establish communication and ask the patient to talk about the situation. Okay, so patterns of violence, abuse, and neglect are what we're going to talk about next. And so abuse and neglect. So victims and perpetrators of violence and abuse may themselves have a mental illness. Assess the following for anything that suggests abuse, neglect, or violence in the patient, the environment, or the persons involved. Document your findings and report your concerns according to the local protocols. Your priorities are safety and management of the acute medical and trauma conditions. When it comes to violence, aggressive behavior may be the patient's way of dealing with feelings of helplessness. Most angry patients can be calmed by a trained person who conveys confidence the patient will behave you well. EMS personnel should be prepared beforehand to deal with hostile or violent behavior. Preventive action is the best way to ensure no one is harmed. Stay alert for possible violent encounters and take measures to prevent violence from happening. Identify situations with the potential for violence. Preventative action starts with being psychologically prepared for a possible violent encounter. So be aware of the possibility during your response to every call and don't rely completely on the information your dispatcher gives you. Develop survival awareness. Risk factors for violence. So scenarios in which violence uh, is more likely include any situations where there's alcohol or illicit drug use, incidents involving large crowds, or incidents in which violence has already occurred. So people who are more likely to be violent include those intoxicated, those experiencing withdrawals, 
those that are psychotic, and those who are experiencing delirium from any cause. Look for the following warning signs. So posture. If they're sitting tensely at the edge of a chair or gripping at an armrest. Speech. So if they're loud, critical, or threatening. Motor activity. If they're unable to sit still or pacing back and forth. Other body language such as clenched fists or your own feelings. Management of violent patients include assess the whole situation. So are factors in the surroundings contributing to the escalation of violence? And can those factors be removed? Does evidence suggest drug use, alcohol use, or head injury or diabetes? Observe your surroundings. Make sure you have an escape route and place yourself between the patient and the door. And don't turn your back on the patient even for a moment. And note any furniture or potential behaviors or barriers and maintain this safe distance. Maintain a safety zone of two arm lengths. If the patient backs away from you, you are too close. Position yourself at a 45 degree angle with your patient with an escape route unobstructive. Try verbal interventions first. So take a moment to concentrate on your thoughts. Acknowledge the patient's behavior and restate your willingness to help. Encourage the patient to talk about what is bothering him or her and show that you are listening. Ask the patient specifically if he or she might lose control or is carrying a weapon and define your expectations of the patient's behavior. If the verbal de-escalation technique is not working, back off and get help. All right, so next we're going to talk about um, specific mood disorders, and they're formally known as affective disorders. It could include manic depressive or major depression, and changes in effect are accompanied by other symptoms as well, so unipolar mood disorders. <clears throat> Moods re where the mood remains at one, only one pole of the depression mania continuum. And bipolar is when the mood alternates between mania and depression. And then you have manic behavior. So patients typically have agitated perceptiveness of joy or euphoria. Patients are typically awake and alert, but easily distracted and fight or flight ideas and delusions of grandeur make it difficult for them to focus on one thing. Their ideas are often grandiose or unrealistic. Memory is usually intact, but may be disoriented by delusions. Their effect is agitated, and patients have a high probability of getting in some sort of trouble. So patients are unlikely to be considered themselves ill and may not agree they need treatment. And if the patient refuses transport, consult medical control. And then a mood order disorder that's common is depression. In 2015, an estimated 16.1 million adults aged 18 years or older in the United States reported that they had at least one major depressive episode in the past year. That number represents 6.7% of all adults in the United States, and they're often identified as a sad expression, bouts of crying, listlessness, expression of worthlessness or guilt, wanting to be left alone, or, and they can occur in episodes with sudden onset and limited duration. Onsets can also be chronic. For diagnosis features of depression, use the mnemonic GAS pipes. Okay, so it stands for guilt, appetite, sleep disturbance, paying attention, interest, psychomotor abnormalities, energy, or suicidal thoughts. Next, we're going to talk about schizophrenia. So schizophrenia, one in 100 people will be affected in their lifetimes. Typical onset occurs during early adulthood and contributing influences may include genetics or microbiologic, psychological, and social influences. Schizophrenics may include or experience delusions, hallucinations, apathy, a flat effect, a lack of interest in pleasure, erratic speech, or an emotional response, or a lack of or extreme motor behavior. 
Okay, so next we're going to talk about neurotic disorders. That's a collection of psychotic or psychiatric disorders without psychotic symptoms. So these include anxiety disorders, so mental disorders in which dominant moods are fear and apprehension, persistent incapacitating anxiety in the absence of external threat, U.S. Uh, pre prevalence of adults with an anxiety disorder in the last 12 months is about 18%. So it's a, there's a generalized anxiety disorder, and that's uh, GAD, or GAD. It's where the patient worries about everything for no particular reason, or worrying prevents patient from deciding what to do about upcoming situations. Symptoms must be present more days than not for a period of about six months. Worry must be difficult to turn on and off, and it's often treated with both pharmacologic agents and counseling. Okay, so the next neurotic disorder we're going to talk about is phobias. And phobic disorders involve an unreasonable fear, apprehension, or dread of a specific situation or thing. Simple phobias focus on anxieties onto one class of objects or situations such as a mice or spiders, maybe high places or darkness or flying. Research suggests about 7% of Americans are affected by social anxiety disorders or phobias. Individuals with social phobias have a fear of everyday social situations. When confronted with the feared object or situation, the phobic person experiences intolerable anxiety. When managing a phobic patient, explain each step of the treatment in detail before carrying it out. Then there's panic disorder, and that is a neurotic disorder characterized by sudden unusually unexpected overwhelm feelings of fear and dread, women more likely to be affected than men, and it attacks usually begin when the patients are in his or her 20s, and if allowed to continue, panic attacks can cause severe lifestyle restrictions. Okay, a large percent of the signs and symptoms are a consequence of the autonomic nervous system discharge. It usually peaks in about 10 minutes and it can last about an hour. When you arrive at the scene, take the following steps. So separate the patient from the panicky bystanders, create a calm environment, tolerate the patient's disability, reassure the patient that he or she is safe, and give the patient's symptoms a name. Help the patient regain control. A panic attack may mimic a range of physiological disorders in its presentation. A patient experiencing a panic attack, especially the first time, should be fully evaluated at the medical facility. Hyperventilating patients should not be treated with paper bag therapy. Try and coach patients to slow their breathing until they regain control. Okay, so let's talk about uh, substance-related disorders. And so generally, they involve over a relatively long period of time. EMS will typically be called when an acute exacerbation occurs. And emergency management typically focus on treating symptomatic complaints and presenting signs and symptoms. So substance-related disorders include alcohol, cigarettes, illicit drugs, or other substances affecting the way the person feels, behaves, or thinks. An estimated 9.7 of the U.S. population use illicit drugs in 2014. They're grouped into four levels. First, you have substance use, then substance intoxication, substance abuse, and then substance dependence, and that's in addition to the substance. Determining the most effective treatment requires an integrate approach. By examining the following dimensions, so social, biologic, cultural, cognitive, and the physiological, understanding the complex nature of substances-related disorders is the first step in providing care. And then there's eating disorders. So a rapid increase in incidents between uh, 1950s and the 1960s, usually women between the ages of 12 and 25, there's two major types of disorders. One is bulimia, and the next is anorexia. Severe electrolyte imbalances leading to uh, cardiac conditions or seizures, renal failure, or erosion of dental enamel or the gland saliv salivary gland enlargement. Also anxiety, depression, and substance abuse disorders as well. 
Bulimia is characterized by consumption of large amounts of food, and the patients compensate by using purging techniques such as vomiting or laxatives. And then there's anorexia, and unlike people with bulimia, people with anorexia are successful at losing weight. The weight loss jeopardizes their health and lives, and patients lose weight by exerting extraordinary control over their eating. Typical patients have decreased body weight and demonstrates uh, intense fear of obesity and experiences um, an absence of menstruation. Okay, next we're going to talk about somatoform disorders. That's a preoccupation with physical health and appearances that dominates a person's life. Patients may have multiple complaints but are more concerned with the symptoms than their meaning. In conversion disorders, a physical condition has no identifiable pathophysiology but results from faking a physical disorder. Then there's factitious disorders, and this includes Munchausen syndrome. Patients intentionally produce or uh, have physical or psychological signs and symptoms. Symptoms are under voluntary control. Patients will typically present at night or on the weekends, and factitious disorder by proxy is a parent intentionally making a child sick to garner attention and pity. Then impulse control disorders, so lack of ability to resist temptations. Some examples include um, intermittent, intermittent expulsive disorders, so acting on aggressive impulses in, involving destruction of property. Typically associated with other disorders such as depression or um, personality disorders or Alzheimer's disease. This is a group of disorders are rare and treatment at a medical facility relies on cognitive and behavioral interventions to identify underlying triggers and influences. Then there's personality disorders. So the American Psychiatric Association, a way of thinking, feeling, and behaving that deviates from expectations of culture, causes distress, or problems functioning. Personality disorders is when the ways of relating to others become dysfunctional or cause distress to other people. The person with this disorder does not feel any subjective distress and others feel such distress acutely. True personality disorders are rare, and another psychiatric illness is likely to be present at the same time. These patients tend to do poorly during treatment. EMS providers have difficulty treating personality disorders over the long term, so be calm and professional in your patient interactions. So patients with psychiatric problems may be taking any of several types of psychotropic drugs drugs that affect mood, thought, or behavior, and during your assessment, identify which medications have been prescribed to the patient and whether they're being taken. Psychiatric medications include antidepressants, and that's prescribed to combat the symptoms of that depressive illness. The main types are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, also serotonin nor epi reuptake inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants or um, oxidase inhibitors. So the mechanism of which of the action lies within the ability to alter levels of neurotransmitters in the autonomic nervous system. So Celexa is the most commonly prescribed antidepressant in the United States. It's primarily used to treat major depressive episodes. It's also useful in anxiety disorders. Adverse effects are minimal, and but they may include headaches or dizziness or sexual dysfunction, nausea or diarrhea. And uh, there's also tricyclic and uh, tetracyclic antidepressants that are primarily used for major depression. They also are effective in panic disorders or obsessive compulsive disorders or social phobia. Examples include um, sometimes uh, anatriptyline. Adverse effects are common and include some anticholergic effects such as dry mouth or blurred vision, and also some nonspecific T wave changes or prolonged QT intervals. Benzodiazepines, so they may be prescribed for s severe emotional distress. They're not a substitute for more formal therapy, though. Short term medication therapy may be helpful. So, other uses include muscle relaxation, sation, control of seizures. 
They're contradicted in patients with known hypersensitivity to benzos, acute narrow angle glycoma, and first trimester pregnancy. So some benzos have long half-lives and gradually accumulate in the body, so they have the greater potential for causing sedation and confusion. And then antipsychotics. So these were first introduced in the 1950s to treat mental health issues such as schizophrenia. Newer medication have less risk of adverse effects and are more effective. So they're known as atypical psychotropic drugs. And um, older medication are known as typical antipsychotic drugs. So AAP agents are often used as a first-line therapy to relieve symptoms such as delusions and hallucinations. They improve quality of life by reducing symptoms of anxiety and depression and reducing suicidal tendencies. They may cause metabolic adverse effects, though. Cardiovascular effects depend on the specific med. Direct, they directly affect the heart and blood vessels. Um, so s such meds such as haraparidol may reduce contractility of the heart. You may see ECG changes, and they may include prolonged prolongation of the QT or PR intervals, blunting of T waves, or depression of the ST segment. It may occasionally cause an acute dystonic reaction. Patients develop muscle spasms of the neck, face, and back, can typically correct by giving diphenhydramine or Benadryl, 25 to 50 milligrams IV, may also cause atropine-like effects, so anticholergic effects such as dry mouth, blurred vision, or urinary retention. And then amphetamine, so it's a powerful CNS and parasympathetic nervous system stimulant. It's prescribed to help with attention deficit disorder and also treat narcolepsy in adults. It raises both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So the effects, there's a psychological effects depend on the dose, the mental state, and the personality of the patient. Results are alertness, reduced sense of fatigue, elevated mood, increased concentration, and euphoria. There are problems associated with medication noncompliance, so we're going to talk about that next. Common reasons patients choose to be non-compliant, and that means not to stay on their meds, include it dulls their senses, slow thinking, and also the cost of the medications. Medication non-compliance often results in frequent confrontation with others when abnormal behaviors develop. And when you are obtaining medical history, always include the previously prescribed meds and mixed doses. So let's talk about emergency use of medications. Every call you respond to will have some behavioral component mixed with it, the patient's trauma and medical problem. In a behavioral crisis, it's likely to escalate. Emergency use of medications may be indicated. Whether verbal, physical, or chemical intervention will be necessary is determined by the intensity of the situation, the patient's response to you, and your protocol. Before administering medications for chemical restraint, complete your assessment. A thorough understanding of the chief complaint, the attention to allergies, and the medications and medical history. The psychological effect of war. So, next we're going to talk about the returning of combat veterans. In 1980, the third edition of the Diagnostics and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders introduced the concept that trauma, traumatic successful events outside of the individual's control can lead to psychological trauma. These events include war, torture, sexual assault, natural disasters, airplane crashes, and factory explosions. Military personnel who experience combat have a high incidence of PTSD. It occurs in up to 20% of veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, 10% of the Gulf, 30% of the Vietnam vets. Emotional triggers include reminders of their time in the military. A 2008 study explored the effects of war on servicemen and servicewomen deployed for oper Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. Results focused on post-traumatic stress disorder, major depression, and traumatic brain injury. 
These conditions are often unrecognized and acknowledged by other service members, family members, and society in general. All three conditions are they affect the mood, thought, and behavior. According to the Department of Veterans Affairs, PTSD can occur for someone who goes through a traumatic event such as combat, assault, or disaster. According to data by the VA Healthcare, from 2002 through 2015, the three most frequent diagnoses of veterans were muscular skeletal ailments, mental disorders, and signs and symptoms, and ill-defined conditions. 57% of all patients encountered were for mental health disorders. Symptoms of PTSD vary in severity, but are usually based on four categories. Intrusive thoughts, avoiding reminders, negative thoughts and feelings, and arousal and reactive symptoms. Acute stress disorder. That's when people experiencing intense distress often develop symptoms within days of the event. Diagnosis is made within the first month of the appearance of symptoms. Symptoms differ from those with PTSD in that they are disassociated symptoms such as amnesia or feeling of emotional numbness. Considered a precursor of PTSD is symptoms persistent. Evaluation may lead to diagnosis of PTSD. An onset of symptoms of PTSD can develop within several months of the event, but the onset of symptoms may be delayed even longer. Paramedics may be called to situations because PTSD causes significant problems in functioning and the ability to respond normally to everyday situations. Developing military culture comp competency is a specific skill that assists you in identifying sometimes subtle indicators of discharged military personnel. Military culture beliefs and ideas of defending a nation or national identity are influenced by culture, loyalty, sacrifice above self, and commitment to society. And when you encounter military servicemen or military service women experiencing medical or behavioral problems, use compassion, understanding, protocols, and acknowledgement of their cultural background. Okay. So this concludes chapter 28 for joining us today.